Good evening. If you have your Bible this evening, I'd like you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, please. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. I'm going to read this first and then we're going to remove to somewhere else. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. First Timothy 4, 12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Let's pray and uh, then we'll move on. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come tonight. We thank you that we can uh, examine your word and, uh, Lord, that we can find good teaching. Uh, Lord, I pray that tonight as we uh, commence looking into your word, I pray that we would settle in our hearts uh, that there is work to be done in our lives. Uh, Help us, Lord, to recognize that we are not perfect Christians. Help us to recognize that we, all of us, uh, have growth yet to do. And I pray that tonight as we look into your word, I pray that you would show us uh, areas of weakness in our life, not out of malice, but out of love for us, that we might grow, we might be stronger. And I pray that tonight as we look into your word, that it might be growth that is upon our minds. Help us, Lord, to be the people that you want us to be. Help us to realize the potential that you've got for us. And we thank you, Lord, for your love for us, even in the way of conviction. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn now back to Daniel chapter 6, please. Daniel chapter 6. And we're going to start reading at verse 11. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 11. Daniel 6, 11, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree? that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Daniel was a prophet, and uh, he is the one who penned the words of this book. Daniel was taken from Israel by the Babylonians. And that happened when he was a young man. Daniel was taken from Israel by the Babylonians, but it wasn't until Babylon was conquered by the Persians that Daniel was cast into the lion's den. And so he was taken from his home by the Babylonians, but it wasn't until the days of Persia that Daniel was cast into the lion's den. Now, if Daniel was captured as a young man in 606 BC, and we know that the Persians didn't conquer the Babylonians until 539 BC. That makes Daniel, if he was around about uh, 10 to 12 years old, 80 years old by the time he's cast into the lion's den. Or if he's around about 20 years old, that makes him around about 90 years old when he's cast into the lion's den. If you were to line up the chapters 
in the book of Daniel in chronological order, you would find that Daniel chapter 6 is towards the end of Daniel's life, consistent with the age that we put on the reign of King Darius in the, in the, in the years of Daniel's life and in the time of Daniel being cast into the den. What we learn then in chapter 6 is one of the last things that we learn about Daniel's character, if not the last thing. At the end of his life, and having witnessed his conduct, Daniel's enemies cast judgment upon Daniel. And this is the lion's den episode. This is the statement at the end of Daniel's life, about 80 or 90 years of age. This is what takes place. Now, skipping back for a moment, we remember from 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, Paul has told us that we need to behave ourselves in a way that is fitting for the church of God. Uh, we find in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12 a description of the example that we ought to set in the church. And we read that in our introduction. We as believers ought to be examples in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Uh, last time we looked on a Sunday morning at how David was an example in faith. And we learn some things from the faith of David. But tonight we're going to continue that look into how to behave ourselves in the church by considering that we need to be an example in conversation. Now just a cursory glance at the scripture shows to us that this word conversation is not referring to our speech. We can see that in 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 4 and verse 12, the verse that we've just read, because our words are separated from our conversation, be an example of the believers in word, in conversation. It's not just speaking about our words. In 1913, the year 1913, the Webster's Dictionary listed the meanings of conversation. And the first meaning that Webster's Dictionary had for conversation in that year was general course of conduct or behavior. Conversation is behavior. It is an archaic way of saying it in our day and age, but that's what the Apostle Paul is speaking about here. The Greek word that's translated conversation is the noun anastrophe. And if we were to have a look at the verb form of that noun, we would find it back in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And it's translated the words that form the title of our series. Have a look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. First Timothy 3.15, Paul says to Timothy, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. And so the word is translated conversation in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. And then the verb form of that same word is translated behave thyself in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And so our conversation is not the things that we say to one another, but it's our behavior. That's what conversation is referring to. It's our conduct. Now, if the gospel, which we learned about this morning, if the gospel is about saving sinners, if it's about imparting righteousness in the place of sinfulness, if it's about walking in newness of life, then how do you think God wants a saved person to live? Do you think a saved person is meant to live in the sinful state that God saved them from? Or do you think that consistent with the effects of the gospel, God wants to take us from sin and help us to live in righteousness? Not just imputed righteousness, but that we should desire to walk in righteousness day in and day out. As Paul says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? There ought to be a conduct, there ought to be a behavior that is fitting of those who make up the church. And I don't think there's any argument about that tonight. We all understand that there is a right way for people who are Christians to behave. Now, behavior is a vast topic to discuss, and I've been wrestling with this all day as I've been coming to preach this tonight. I am fully aware 
that I am not going to define for you all of the behaviours that are fitting for a Christian. I'm not going to define for you all the behaviours that are not fitting for a Christian. And I'm also fully aware that it's not my job to do so. The Holy Spirit was given to us that He might lead us in our choices. That He might highlight to us the things that are right and the things that are wrong. And so tonight, as I preach, I am heavily relying on the Holy Spirit's work in your heart. I know that I'm able to go to a passage of Scripture and point out a behavior that is good for Christians, other behaviors that's, uh, that are spoken about in the Word that are not good for Christians, but tonight I'm going to leave that work to the Holy Ghost. There are some examples we will touch on, but I want you to listen to the Spirit in your heart tonight. I want you to listen to those parts of your conduct that the Holy Spirit is putting His finger on tonight so that you might take up your issue with God and not me when He convicts your sin. Behaviour is a vast topic to discuss and so rather than going for a definition of all of godly behaviour tonight, I thought we would turn to the example of Daniel. In Daniel, we find a great example of godly conduct. Those who lived around Daniel witnessed his lifelong example as a worshipper of the true God, but living behind enemy lines, that example of Daniel caused quite a stir. Think about it. He was a Jew living in Babylon and then Persia, and he was trying to live in a way that pleased his God. And he caused trouble just by trying to be a loyal follower of his God. And it was his conduct that eventually saw him thrown into the lion's den. It was his behavior, the stuff that he chose to do. That's what got him thrown into the lion's den. But you know what? From the time that he entered into Babylon as a young man, his behavior set the example. And that's where we're going to start tonight. First of all, Daniel, and there's only two points. First of all, Daniel had a continual conversation a continual holy conversation. Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 3 to 8. It was really hard for me to have to pull out whole chunks of the book of Daniel and not be able to use them tonight because there's so many examples of Daniel's conduct and it would be a great study. Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 to 8, it says, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favoured, and skilful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, unto Hananiah of Shadrach, to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel was chosen for having no defect, being well favoured or being of good appearance. He was a healthy specimen who looked healthy. That's how he was chosen. He was chosen for being intelligent and well-educated. Now, did you notice, I want to point this out to you, that uh, he was chosen for understanding science. That's what all the smart people do. They're understanding science. Isn't that right, Anthony? All the smart people are understanders of science. So understanding science made them especially um, accepted cunning in knowledge, such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. All of these things were ways that the king knew that these guys would be able to handle the language barriers that were going to be thrown at them and they were going to be good advisors in the king's court. 
Daniel was blessed. He looked blessed, he'd grown up blessed, and he acted blessed. He was educated, he was intelligent, and he was from a privileged background. And yet, he was still concerned with his religion. He still cared about doing what was right in the eyes of God. He purposed in his heart not to defile himself. He was in a foreign land. You think about this. He was in a foreign land. He had unfamiliar customs, but he purposed in his heart that he was going to respect the law of his God, a foreign God to him. He was going to respect the law of his God. Now, we aren't told why the king's meat and the king's wine were defiled to Daniel, but we are told that they were. He considered them to be defiling things. But we do know that the Jews had strict dietary restrictions placed upon them by God. And this is probably why Daniel refused them. It's probably because this food and this drink was against what God had uh, mentioned, what God had defined in his law. And so Daniel purposed in his heart. Despite being favoured in appearance, despite being favoured in education, despite being in a foreign land, Daniel remained faithful to effectively the Word of God, to the law of God. He was willing to be faithful. And that can be really hard when we're surrounded by a system and by other people who don't care about that. When we are foreigners in a place that doesn't care about the Word of God. It made me think, I wonder how many of our young people, Daniel was a young person, I wonder how many of our young people are Daniels. I remember way back then, uh, one of the temptations for youth is to fit in no matter the cost. It's a temptation to fit in. Uh, whether it's when you start a new school, uh, when you try and figure out where you fit in in the youth group, uh, when you go to camp, and you've got to try and figure out the pecking order and what group you fit in with at camp. Uh, whether you're starting off in a sports team or whether it's just the friends in your street, often there's a struggle to fit in, to know where you belong, to know who you are. And it is tempting to try and make thing or take the easy way to fit in, to try and change things so that you are more likable. Daniel was a new guy in Babylon. All of these young people had just arrived, probably from all different areas. There was a number of them who'd arrived from Judah and they were just turning up. They were establishing themselves, they were trying to earn a reputation with the king, they were trying to establish a reputation with the prince of eunuchs and it was a competitive situation. They were trying to figure out who would be the best suited to stand in the king's palace and all of these young people are standing there together. There's competition Now, Daniel could have uh, got above some of the others by making fun of the others, by trying to point out why they were no good and he was better, by trying to make a lot of their faults. But he didn't choose that option. He could have chosen to fit in or chosen to meet the king's uh, level by fitting in with sinful Babylonian customs. He could have chosen to do that. That would have been the easy way. And that's the way that many young people decide to take. I know that's the way uh, that I took in a number of occasions. And it was foolish. Daniel, on the other hand, had convictions. Daniel loved his God. And because he loved his God and kept his convictions, he knew that what the Babylonians were asking was against the law of God. And so he respectfully abstained. He said, I know that I can't do that as a believer in God, and so I'm not going to do that. Regardless of how much it might help my chances, I'm not going to do that. But you know, as he respectfully abstained, there's a point there which we can't stop and dwell on, as he asked to not take of some of the king's food. He did it with faith that God would still take care of him. I'm not going to have any of this. I don't want to have to eat this food, but... I know that God can do a work here. Have a look. Daniel chapter 1, verses 11 to 14. Then said Daniel to Melzer, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. 
and let them give us pulse to eat. This was the alternative and water to drink. Then let our countenances, our appearances, be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. See, Daniel's not using his faith as an excuse to rebel against the Babylonians. He didn't uh, use it like some people do as a veil for his own rebellion and his own selfishness. He assured the Babylonians that if you allow us to abstain from this king's meat, it is going to be better for us and therefore it's going to be better for you too. We're going to look better than everybody else who's having the meat and the wine. Let's have a look, verses 15 and 16, how it turned out. And at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in the flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus, Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. That's the uh, funny little irony in this, is that at the end of this experiment, Daniel was proven right, and therefore all of the other young people had the meat and the wine taken off them too. <laughs> you know, young people, your example in Christianity can show adults that you're right. You can prove that there is something in Christianity. If you live in an unsaved home, you need to be a respectful testimony of Jesus Christ. You need to say, no, I would respectfully ask that I don't have to do that. And I'm going to show you by my conduct that it's going to work out better if I'm a Christian in your house. I'm going to be a better son or daughter in this house. I'm going to show you how being a Christian is the better option. Be a testimony to your teachers. Be a testimony to your coaches, to your friends, to your neighbours, whoever it might be. Say, no, I can't do that. But let me show you something better. The life that I'm going to live is a better life. And it's going to work out better for everyone. It's the thing that you ought to be taking hold of yourself. Be a testimony to those who are around you, not just the troublesome Christian who won't do things, but show them a better way, a way that's real, a way that's living. And so Daniel cared about a holy conversation from a young age. As a young man, he said, yeah, I'm going to do the right thing. But do you know what? Daniel didn't just chalk up that youthful zeal and say, yep, I've shown that I'm real about my religion and then put it in his pocket for the rest of his life. He didn't leave that zealous care for holiness in his youth. Remember, Daniel's an old man when Darius comes to power in Daniel chapter 6. Kingdoms have risen and fallen. Rulers have come and gone. But Daniel hasn't changed. In fact, the things spoken about Daniel at the end of his life are probably even more honorable than the things that are spoken about him as a young man. As an 80 or 90 year old, Daniel is a man of integrity. Daniel chapter 6, flip over there and we're going to read the first verses of the chapter now. Daniel chapter 6 verses 1 to 3. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. And so the king had an idea of setting up his kingdom, and he said he was going to set up a whole lot of princes who were going to keep an eye out over the whole kingdom. And then over the top of those princes, he was going to set three presidents who were going to keep an eye over the princes to make sure that nothing was going wrong. And then over those three presidents, or first primary of those three presidents, he was going to have Daniel. Daniel was going to be the overseer of the whole realm. You know, it doesn't take Darius very long to figure out that this guy's the one that he needs at the top. Darius isn't in the job very long by the time he gets Daniel in this place. There was an excellent 
spirit in Daniel. It means that he was a man of integrity. It means that he was a man of industry. He got things done and he got things done with a good spirit about him. He was someone who could be trusted. He was very useful to the kingdom. He was to be Darius's top overseer. And that's familiar, isn't it? Like Joseph was to Pharaoh, like Mordecai would be to Ahasuerus. Uh, this is a position that people who honoured God uh, were often found out to be the best at because they were honouring those in authority as well. And so Daniel possessed an excellent spirit. Zeal for being separated under his God hadn't waned. Even though he was a, a good worker, even though he was someone that was great to be at the top of the kingdom, Daniel still cared about righteousness, holiness, about separation under his God. Read verse 4. Then the presidents, that's the other two, and princes, everyone underneath them, sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. This is scary stuff. Daniel's enemies studied him. That's invasive, isn't it? Daniel's enemies studied him. They looked for an occasion against him, and it says specifically concerning the kingdom. They tried to find out how he had broken the law of the Medes and Persians or, or how he may have been um, against the king in some way. They were looking for an excuse to blame Daniel, how he had done something questionable. But they found no instance. They found no fault. They found no error. It's a big statement. They found in Daniel nothing but faithfulness. He was clean as a whistle when it came to keeping Persian rules and regulations. And the only fault that they could find in Daniel was one that makes him look even better to us. In verse 5 we read on and it says, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. You know, the, the idea that his enemies got was, we know that Daniel will keep the laws of his God more strictly than he will keep the laws of Persia. We know that Daniel would rather offend the king than offend his God. Now just stop and think about that for a moment. What a great testimony. Even his enemies looked at him and said, Daniel prioritizes his God over the king. Daniel prioritizes his God over what's going to get him ahead in his life here in Persia. That's some reputation. It says something when even your enemies can rely on your holiness to catch you out. What a testimony for Daniel to have after close scrutiny and near the end of his life. Some of these people had probably known him from Babylon days. And they knew that he was reliably holy. Daniel's conduct was still exemplary in his old age. And this is faithfulness. Right from his young days to his old days, Daniel honoured the Lord. Daniel hadn't marred his name with scandal through his life. He hadn't grown cold in his commitment to God. He hadn't grown cold in his diligence to keep God's word. Daniel honoured God from start to finish. Even at 90, he was still an example of how to behave yourself as a follower of God. And what a challenge that is to us. We can't burn out brightly and show to people how much we honour the word of God and how much we want to be a Christian and how much we want to serve God and then give up. We can't. We can't say I'm going to be holy and prove to everyone that I'm really a Christian and then forget about it. Holiness is not that much and not that important anymore. As much as a fallible sinner could, Daniel honoured the Lord in his behaviour from start to finish. So he had continual conversation in holiness. The second thing that we learn about Daniel was that he had consistent conversation. I know that, that word could be applied to the first one as well, but we're just going to use it for the second one. 
consistent conversation. Let's have a look at Daniel chapter 6. And this time we're going to read from verse 6. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counsellors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, there's a lie there to start with, isn't there? Right at the start, all the presidents of the kingdom had not agreed together because Daniel didn't. Verse 8, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. And verse 10, there is so much in this verse, don't miss it. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. There is a series of messages in there. Verse 10 tells us that Daniel was well aware of the prohibition on Jewish prayer. He knew that it was illegal to pray like God had told him to pray. It also tells us that it wasn't something that Daniel was just going to go and start doing because it was prohibited. Daniel wasn't just going to go and start saying, well, I have to show that I'm a prayer, so I better go and pray now that it's illegal so that I can be caught. This was something that he did before time. Daniel had a regular habit of praying three times a day. Now we might read Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10 and think, well, Daniel's trying to get caught. <laughs> the way that he's praying here is trying to show everybody how much he's praying, but he's not. It was lawful prayer. God had in fact told his people if they found themselves in captivity one day as a result of their sin, they were to pray towards the temple in Jerusalem that God might forgive their sins and bring them back. They were told to face towards Jerusalem. And so Daniel wasn't opening his windows to show off. He was opening his windows to pray towards the destroyed temple back in Jerusalem so that he might be heard as the promise of God had said. If you want to read about that, you can turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. Uh, read it in your own time. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 46 to 49. It tells us all about the promise that God made to his people when they would one day be in captivity. Daniel was praying scripturally, not as a show-off. And just as Daniel knew, this was a trap. People were waiting for him to get down on his knees and start praying. But I think that the crisis of this narrative in itself is a vindication of Daniel's character. This moment is really a wonderful moment in the life of Daniel. Verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. I am hugely relieved to read in that verse that they found Daniel praying. You know, Daniel had a public testimony of being a holy man. He had shown kings their dreams. He'd stood up to the prince of the eunuchs. He'd been a man who'd even confronted the sinful king Belshazzar at the end of the Babylonians and told him that he was a wretched king and that he was going to be judged and killed. Daniel had a great public reputation. But what a blessing for these men to break into his private room and not find mistresses or idols or all sorts of filth strewn around the place. They found Daniel doing in private what they assumed he would be doing because of his public testimony. What a blessing. And what a horrible blight on the church that so many people in the church have found to be doing otherwise. 
People who stand up in the pulpit and preach God's word and preach holiness disqualify themselves through private filth. But they found Daniel doing what he said he honoured in public. Daniel was no hypocrite. He had consistent holy conversation inside and out. But you know, he didn't go the other way either. He wasn't just a, co- a closet believer who said he believed in God in private, but then when the rubber met the road out in public, he wasn't prepared to show it to other people. No, Daniel was both. He was a private worshipper of God and he was a public worshipper of God. As he was cast into the lion's den, the king was very right to observe Daniel's consistency. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 16. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And you know what? The king was right. Daniel did continually serve the Lord. You want to find out the reason why Daniel was sitting in the lion's den that night? He was sitting in the lion's den because he consistently served the Lord and everybody else knew it. Behaving ourselves in the church means being an example by continual and consistent holy living. We need to be holy start to finish, inside out. Everything needs to be holiness unto the Lord. Are we concerned about holiness in our home and in our church? Because they both count. Do we pray in our closet and in a prayer meeting or at church? Are we humble like we try and appear to be? Do we honour the word of God that we carry under our arm? Are we both privately and publicly of good conversation? This is how we need to behave ourselves in the church. This is the way that we're meant to be. Now, while Daniel has encouraged us by being an example of holy conduct, I am well aware Such an example also disappoints us because we know that there are deficiencies in our own lives. And I I confess, I know that's the truth. But you know what? We must see this as a sign of health in our lives. If you are disappointed by the fact that you don't live up to what what God wants you to be, then that's a sign of spiritual health. Not only in seeing what needs to change in our behavior that hopefully we will be stronger tomorrow than we are today because we know that something needs to change and we're going to endeavor to change it. But also in seeing disappointment over sin as an indicator that there is a flicker of spiritual life in our hearts. That conviction over sin is a good sign for the Christian. I read a quote I was reading in a book uh, just yesterday and this quote stuck out to me. Let us, as far as God has revealed it to us, confess the deep sin of our nature. It has been said with much truth that the only sign of one's being in Christ, which Satan cannot counterfeit, is the grief and sorrow which true believers undergo when God discloses to them the sinfulness of inbred sin. There's a thought to ponder over. Now, we dare not excuse sin as good, for it's not. But conviction and confession, when we're aware of sin, are signs of spiritual health, not illness in the Christian. So if you feel convicted about your sin, that's a good step. If you are convicted about your conduct, that is far better than being unmoved by the sin that is most certainly there. The truly fearful place is when a Christian is comfortable 
living an unholy life. Or when they're convicted, but they refuse to do anything in repentance. That's the bad place to be. And so tonight, if we realize that there are deficiencies in our conduct, if we realize that we're not behaving ourselves as we ought to be behaving ourselves, and I think with an example like Daniel's, it's hard not to think that. And the place that we need to go is straight to the Lord. We need to be willing to confess our sin. And we need to be willing to realize that the problem between us and God is a darkness. And that that darkness is our own personal sin. We need to be willing to fall at the feet of God. And be willing to say to the Lord, I've failed and I need to change. Be willing to recognize that the blood of Jesus Christ is adequate. And to say tomorrow, it's not good enough just to keep doing this, but I need to do better. This is the way that a Christian addresses sin, not by laughing at it and turning the other way. We need to be serious about this. For this is the life that God wants us to live. And so I trust that God has been able through the message to point out particulars to point out specifics and as we think about our life we need to make sure that we are living consistently year in year out the life that God has called us to live and make sure that life goes from public all the way to private lest we be found to be hypocrites let's pray Heavenly Father, we would thank you tonight, Lord, for a glimpse into our own hearts. And we pray that you would, Lord, please help us by your spirit to see that you want better things for us. You want us to live a life that is joyful, that is at peace with you, and that can be found to be in victory. Now, Lord, we know that you want to help us, and we pray that we might find that help tonight. Father, I pray that you would help each of us to be the people that you want us to be. We commit ourselves to you now and we pray that you would, Lord, move in our hearts as we close. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.